Hi, Book Club members. I'm Jen. And I'm Carrie. And this is Warhammer 40k Book Club, where we read from a crag. This is episode number 49, and our book is The Swords of Kelth by Graham McNeil. This is the continued adventures of Uriel Ventress, now freshly made Primaris. We posted several questions on our website, wh40kbookclub.com, and we encourage participation in our conversations via Twitter, YouTube, our site, or Encrypted Vox channel. Look at all the offerings we offer. Spoiler warning, if you haven't yet read this book, go check out the post and the book, and then come back to this post as we'll be discussing the book from start to finish in great detail. Not that there's a lot of spoilers in this. No lore bombs in this book. With that, let's dive in. <laughs> did you like the book? I really did, yes. Was it... So, okay. When the book came out, I was like, oh, we haven't read we haven't read Uriel Ventress in so long. I didn't realize how long it had been. So, was it worth the wait? Was it just like coming home and putting on your favorite sweater? That's a good way of putting it. Yeah, it was just it's just kind of like you start reading, it's like hanging out with old friends. It very much reminded me, and I think everybody has these friends who like, you don't talk for several years, but when you do see them, it's like no time has passed whatsoever. And you just pick up like, we just saw each other yesterday, even though it's been like six years. Um, it reminded me of that. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, the case. And but like every time somebody was introduced, I was like, oh, come here, let's get a <laughs> hug. Like I wanted to hug literally everybody. I I really liked this book. So, what parts stood out to you? Oh, well, there are a few. Um, probably the biggest one is probably one of yours as well. And it's when uh, Pisanius calls out Uriel for being cold hearted. So just yes. an example of the Rubicon kind of, you know, altering perspectives. And he was being super pragmatic, which is something that we have... And I kind of liked that Graham McNeil did this, that he didn't leave Uriel 100% intact because we've seen this so much with um, many of the, mostly the new Primaris, that mm -hmm. they get overly pragmatic and then kind of stop caring for their constituents. And, you know, we saw this especially in Knights of McCrag uh, with, with that one Primaris, and uh, which is... And even made like his Primaris captain irritated. It's like, okay, you need to learn a lesson because you've forgotten what we're here for. Right. And I thought that was so so great of Pisanius to point out, you've forgotten yourself. You've forgotten why you're here, what you're supposed to be doing, why we're even on this planet. So I thought that was right. such a great moment. Um, that and there was other moments of where, you know, yes, Uriel's changed. He's bigger, badder, bigger better faster more but he's not perfect and right. he still makes mistakes so i mm -hmm. i like that as well i did like that um God, there were so many little scenes that i really liked i really liked when he went to see gulliman that was so awesome um they're, i really they're really like best friends interaction like, they just they're best friends now that's just ever since uh uriel showed up in uh plague war they're best friends now it really did feel more like father-son relationship though mm -hmm. right which i thought was so nice because when he like says when he's just like oh you know you've been you've petitioned to see me like hardcore so this better be kind of important and then when they're just sitting there talking and when he's drawing it out of Uriel because he's like I know my sons like what's really going on here like it was just it was that softer side of Gulliman that we don't always get to see mm -hmm. and I just I really liked it and it, it hit me in the feels a little bit because again I love Reboot I love Uriel and I just loved this idea that Again, it just felt very father son and him kind of giving him permission. I liked the idea too that, like, he petitions to ask him, like, I want to go and do this thing. Why? Well, here's my reasons for it. All right, go do what you got to do. Like, I like the idea that Gulliman is not just this, nope, it's my way or the highway. Like, I've given you orders, go F off. No, it's 
he does listen to his sons, which I think was just so again, the he, whole thing was nice. He almost didn't grant it because he was like, "No, you better tell me the real reasons, or um, you're not doing this." That's I liked that too. It is apparent, like you can kind of yeah. relate to that, right? Oh yes, just, you can recognize when you're being fed a line, right? Or you're being fed home. what you think that the parent wants to hear, right? Or where something's getting obfuscated, and it's it's similar, like with your own kids, right? When they they finally are just like, "I want to go because this one person's going to be there." Okay, that's all you had to say. Right. Like, you know, so I really liked the idea that he is like, he does listen. And it was, it was such a humanizing moment for both of them. Mm -hmm. Really loved it. Um, There was so many things in this that I really liked. Of course, the Titan. Okay. I know you have a thing. You have a thing with the Titans. I love the Titans in general. Uh, But one of the things that stood out to me, and again, it's, I love when you're like, wait a minute and then they acknowledge the wait a minute so when they talk about after they teleport into the center of the earth and that they're like oh it was like a hundred days before they were rescued i was like dude those human crew people are going to be dead and they're like the human crew lasted longer than we thought okay um and we'll talk a lot more about this later but when the necrons were devouring my first thought is I was like, why the hell would a Necron need to devout? How does this even work? And then like a paragraph later, Uriel is like, why though? How? <laughs> like even he is confused. So He's like, like, these oh. are not any Necrons I've ever worked with or against, I right? guess. <laughs> right? Um, I, I just really like when you're like, hold up. And then authors immediately are like, don't worry, it weird. I like that Um, that I will say Graham McNeil I feel very comfortable saying this Graham McNeil is the master of bolter porn because he really is because this book is definitely bolter porn but like it has heart it's like bolter porn that has heart Mm mm-hmm there's a story, there's characters that you connect with and you love, and you feel good about reading it. It's not just boom, 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 blood explosions. Like, there's, it's not Pearl Harbor. Um, <laughs> missed you more than that movie, missed the point. It's an awful lot. Um, Never saw the movie. And I was warned not to. Yeah, don't. Um, but it's, it's just... I mean, he really does. Like, I feel like a lot of times people talk about boulder porn and they say it like in a derogatory, like, it's just boulder porn. This, I feel like Graham McNeil always proves that he's just like, oh, by the way, this shit's just fun. Right. I mean, I mean, want to you, hug everyone. you could argue that a lot of stuff is just boulder porn. Uh, like, right. shit, Dark Imperium, you can. There's a lot of war going on in Dark Imperium. Oh. Well, yeah, but there's a lot more lore stuff going on. Like, nothing really lore-wise change shifts in this. Um, Which was nice. Other than the fact that they do acknowledge. Because remember, we actually... This was, this was so rewarding for me. Because if you remember when we read the Belisarius Call book, I was like, wait a minute. Like, nobody has talked about the fact that the Nightbringer shard is out there. Right. That was one thing I did kind of like about this. Is like, yeah, we haven't forgotten that my first book, I released a Catan shard. <laughs> I love that. I did like that this was kind of like a, oh yeah, he's still out there. I thought that was great. Um, but like, it's not lore changing. It's not, it's not groundbreaking. There wasn't like a total plot twist. It was really just the point of it was characters that you know and love are going to go and kill a bunch of stuff. They're doing what they do best. Oh, and by the way, like, remember the Necrons? We're making the Necrons important now, so here they are. Okay, you guys, I was so salty about the Necron. Like, oh, we're going to shoehorn the Necrons back in there. Mm, Great. Um, This book made me less salty about it. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, it made... kind of bridged. It made sense, like, why the Necrons... Mm -hmm were even there and I guess I kind of liked it because it was different than most of the Necrons that we've seen waking up at this time mainly because these Necrons were crazy yo 
Yeah. So, Uriel's back. Um, let's talk about. So let's. We talked a little bit about this, but I really want to dive into this because I absolutely agree with your analysis of it. Let's talk about Primaris Uriel versus OG Uriel. Like, what do you think of some of the Primaris changes that we see in this? I mean, aside from the physical changes, obviously, um, he is he's able to process a lot more quickly. So it's almost like it's almost like the world is moving more slowly for him, right? Because he's able to process things so quickly. So I think he's become a better strategist because of, and he always was a pretty good strategist. But now there's not that hesitancy anymore. Like he can instantly see things and react versus like if you like those the last book, the sixth book in the trilogy, the trilogies, um, he would he hesitated a couple of times, which is how he got shot in the yeah. eye because he did hesitate, mm-hmm. you know, just things like that. And it's like I feel like he's not doubting himself anymore. It's almost Very which, so. which I think is also a lot because Thanks to Guy Haley, we actually see the moment where Gulliman, like, forgives him or lets him know, like, you didn't do anything wrong. And so that kind of gives Uriel back a lot of his confidence in himself Mm -hmm. and in his leadership. Right. And I, I liked that because you're absolutely right. I feel like this is like a, like a growing up moment for him. Because, like, Goleman, of course, has been renowned as being a brilliant strategist. And we kind of see glimpses of that in his sons, Cato Sicarius, for sure, right? But I think you're right. I think Uriel kind of lacked that confidence or that ability to maybe, I think because he was such a passionate person. Like, in terms of Space Marines, Uriel was very emotional Mm -hmm. and very passionate. And this, I think that kind of, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, but just that some of that emotional neutering almost really did give him this glimpse. And it is part of it is that his brain is just, I mean, he's processing data so much quicker that he can take a step back and see that larger strategy around him. But he, yeah, I mean, he feels more like a leader now. I think also, you know, one thing that was actually touched on in the very first book, Nightbringer, and it kind of carried on throughout, was that the reason why Ideas chose him was because Uriel, like, Ideas thought outside the box. But the problem with Uriel is that he knew he was thinking outside the box and would immediately hesitate because he was thinking outside the box. And Mm -hmm. now he realizes that thinking outside the box is what they need, I guess, especially with this, you know, brave new world that's going on. We got the Indominus and right. galaxies torn in half. And by the way, I'm a whole new thing now. Um, has just kind of taken that, taken that out. It's like, you know, it's, it's okay to think outside the box. Very much. I do like the idea that there was a price to becoming a Primaris in some ways. Right. And you're right that he's so lucky that he had Pisanius who <laughs> um so huge shout out to panty mauser by the way because i was like oh, i really hope Pisanius is in this and she read the book and she dm'd me and was like there's a lot of Pisanius in it uh that's a moment that stood out when they when he had faked you into thinking he had killed Pisanius. i even told my husband i was like i will burn this book um, and send the ashes to Graham McNeil. I was um, I was not pleased because like I, I'm not as big a fan of Pisanius as you, but these two like Uriel needs Pisanius and Pisanius needs Uriel and it's two but they're kind of like they're complements the yin and the yang they very just very much so. they are there to keep the other one grounded very much so and I think like I mean he really did almost literally serve kind of as Gemini Cricket. And this one, because I love the idea that there was a price for Uriel. Yes, you're stronger, faster, stronger. You've been rebuilt. You are the $6 million space marine. Um, I loved that idea. But then I did kind of like it that it's like, oh, yeah, by the way, like, it, it also took a huge part of what made you, you, that humanity to you. And I did like, like, when he first sees Basanius and he's like, why am I not as happy to see him as he is to see me? 
like he has this disconnect and i did like when asanius has to be like bro like have you forgotten what we're about that i thought was really nice um Mm -hmm. he's lucky that he had basanius it would be interesting to see what would have happened had he not been there and because basanius also is comfortable enough to call him out on it right like i'm not necessarily sure that the other guys would have felt enough impropriety to say like what are you doing but Pisanius has that right and Pisanius also has the wherewithal to um keep it private like not 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 only not let the humans hear what he's going to say Mm -hmm. but not let the others in the company even though they're all trusted friends, you know, they all end up kind of being in Uriel's little entourage at, at, at the end, kind of like his own little mm-hmm. Mordeval at the end. But, uh, but yeah, just um, that respect that you sometimes don't see, mm-hmm. like, which is something that, well, that, you know, Lee Archis would have done back in the early part of the trilogy. He totally would have called him out in front of everybody. Oh, my god yeah well i feel like especially in book five when he first comes back right when Pisanius yeah, and Uriel first come back serious Lyrchus tension was, oh my god Lyrchus was not happy at all which at first i was like excuse you but I under- like once he kind of explains it right you're like i understand why he is having problems with Uriel coming back i understand it like a, totally. a little bit um which is why, like, it took me forever to be like, I don't like you. It, it, it kind of came around, you know, in that fifth book when the Archis realizes how hard it is to stay with the Codex. And he realizes that he was about to commit something that he actually turned Uriel in for. And kind of had that humble, that humbling mm-hmm. moment. But he was still kind of a dick in that sixth book. So I was like, I'm so over you. So this book, uh, you know, it's also been like how many years? Like, forget how many years it's been in our years, just like, you know, imperial years, I guess. Right. There's They've had some growing up to do. And, like, I even tweeted out, I was like, well, I guess I finally, I guess I forgive Lee Arches. And Graham uh, McNeil, you know, replied back. He's like, they've grown up a lot together over the years. I'm like, obviously, you know, they've grown up a lot. Cause, and, of course, and, and but that's one of the great things about Graham McNeil is that, he knew people would be having those feelings about Learchus because when we first see him and when Learchus finds out that, you know, <laughs> the actual, meaning Uriel, is on the planet, he immediately starts like being, thinking about how excited he is to see him and how ridiculous it all feels looking back with their little rivalry back in the day. It's like, like, he, like, you loved did, that. You did that on purpose. You know, exactly. It's oh, that, very much so. It's that one thing I've always liked about Graham McNeil is that he knows what the readers want or what they're pondering yes. and if you don't believe me read the magnus primark novel because if you want any feels whatsoever about magnus or perturbo they are all in there so he knows how to trigger things and it's like ending is and you know that's what he's doing but he does it so well you don't care yes he definitely i feel as though more than any of the other authors he really has his finger on the pulse of what his fans will like of this series and you know what it really could just be like a wild coincidence that he's like well i feel like i need to give Lyrchus like a a moment but it just happens to work for us but i i don't think so like i think he knows and i actually really loved that scene when Lyrchus is basically like ah, we were such silly children back then <laughs> like i love and like I, I got like at the end when they made him the ancient. Oh, like, that was such a cool moment. <sighs> Full body chills. Okay, I um, was super sad when ancient when the ancient died. Like I was actually getting close to tears when the ancient was like blubbering over dropping the banner. So, yes, and even you like, dude, it, it's okay. Like we know. It wasn't in cowardice or anything else, but he just could not. We didn't. We didn't lose it. Right, either. and he, but he couldn't. He just got chooched. He couldn't forgive himself for it, and it was super sad when he got killed by the death mark. 
Well, and I also liked that. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. So let's talk a little bit about the Necrons here because they're really front and center. Like this is arguably a Necron book. Um, so did you, do you think this effectively tied the Indominus? Like, do you feel like you have a better concept of what they're doing and how they're moving forward with Indominus now? No. And it's, and that's mainly because the impression I got about what they were doing with Indominus from the first Dark Imperium novel mm -hmm. is not what it has become. So, like, my impression from reading Dark Imperium was that the whole point of the Indominus was to find a way to close the rift and kind of get, trying to basically get all of our ducks in a row, figure out where everything is, and work to close the rift. That was my impression of Indominus. And somewhere along the way, I guess because Dark Imperium takes place 100 years later, or it did, and all that, and I think it's actually at the, the close of the Indominus Crusade, or it's the halfway you know what they kept I feel like they kept changing their minds what was going on so when they decided to you know let's let's actually take a few steps back and start the beginning of the Indominus Crusade even though I'm all going but why though and then introducing the Necrons that felt so shoehorned in because they wanted to sell Necron toys let's 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 be real that's really really what it what this was all about right and so and they're beautiful models. They are, they are, and I'm not, you know, and I understand that. No, I totally know. And I understand because the books, that's what, you know, the, let's be, I mean, let's be real. The board game is first, first and foremost, and the books support that. So if Games Workshop decides that we want to make all these new shiny Necron models, the books were going to have to follow suit with that somehow. And this is how they chose to do it. I just think it's a really back ass words way to handle it and it doesn't fit very very well especially if you've read the dark imperium books and you come back to this you're like like you kind of feel like the guy from it's always sunny in philadelphia he's got like the pepe little, silva yeah the little line chart does he's like the line map it's very like, much yes so. yeah so yeah very no much so. and Honestly, and it, with the Necron books that we have read, it all just kind of jumps around. So I'm not exactly sure yeah. what the Necrons are doing, aside from maybe they're waking up. Maybe they're not. Maybe it's just Trazen and Orican just starting a civil war for no reason. Or for giggles, I should say. It's not for no reason. It's for giggles. Let's be real. It's just to get one up on the other one. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just... Yeah. I don't know. I agree. I did find this one interesting. I, I was very excited about it because typically with the Necrons, like in, in the previous books that we've read, I've been kind of cold. Like, on like, them. like the Indominus book, for example. Very much so. Um, did not care. Really didn't care about the Necrons in general. Um, this was the first book where I was like, okay, so this is interesting. Like, but it does. I, I have a little bit of concern that this is like um, them kind of establishing that, yeah, you know, some of the Necrons are going to wake up not quite right. Like, we already know that some of them have problems, but like, I don't think we knew like to this extent that they have problems, um, which is interesting that they're basically like having like a, um, so what I'm looking for, like, I totally can't think of this as a software term, but like when they, when you reach a bug and it just kind of starts looping, right? Like I just figured this, they were having an existential crisis. That could be too. All of a sudden they woke up and they were like, guys, we're just trapped in metal bodies. Or, um, you know, one thing that, um, they kind of talked about in Robert Rath's book. Infinite and divine. Thank you. They kind of talked about how there were plenty of the Necrons, like, after the biotransference, they were not well. Like, they were like, this is right. not what we signed up for. We are not handling it. And they and they mentioned how they were either were killed outright because they were going insane. They slowly went insane and kind of became, like, um, vegetables. Or they kind of put them in sleep until they could figure it out. And this kind of almost felt like this was, like, where they put all those had problems like this is like their australia <laughs> he's put them <Right>. there 
<laughs> right. We'll, we'll come get you when we figure this out. But it's been like, you know, thousands of years and everyone's forgotten. Big shock. And now that they've all woken up because the eagles are no longer circling the mountain, they're not well. And then we have this cast off piece unwanted piece of Nightbringer who is also not well <laughs> forcing him to do like a reenactment <laughs> right <laughs> well so like weird. like they woke up and they see, I took it more like it was like a bug like they woke up and they're like okay this is what we gotta do and it doesn't it doesn't matter that you know they can't they can't do the thing they can't realize it and um so one thing I did like um, <laughs> with the eagles circling the mountain, I was like, yeah, yeah, the eagles are definitely still circling the mountain. Goddamn Imperials. Uh, which is kind of fun. Uh, but I I guess I do have a... Ba- this book, oddly, helped me understand a little bit more of the scope of the Indominus Crusade. That, like, Gulliman is so busy. And the fact that Uriel, I mean, it takes him forever to get this audience with him to say like I want to go and do this thing and it takes forever and then yeah like he has so many other things going on I imagine Uriel's like secretary or whatever is just like oh okay so hmm hold on how is six months from Tuesday (laughs) exactly like um I can get you it in Q4 um they still have cues. Uh, anyways, like I mean, it would have to be that far out, right? Like I also, I also had that idea where they were just like, "This is your first t- available, t- first available appointment. First available appointment <laughs> is six months from now." And he could um, cancel because of war, right? Exactly. <laughs> uh, he's a little busy. Um, totally. I the madness of the Necrons was very interesting. Well, I mean, it kind of was, but it was it was really, it was gross. And I do, and I will say right now, again, su- like such a bizarre flex, fr- good way bizarre flex from Graham McNeil. That scene when they're all captured by the Necrons and the one guy gets devoured and they slowly, Poor, like they can't move their armor. Poor Dreadnought. Was- Poor one out. Guys, that affected me like way hard. He couldn't because even the like dreadnoughts. That's not cheap. Like that's a lot of technology, and that guy's been around for a really long time, and he just got and he can't fight back. Like, okay, I was saying I was saying this to my husband that every time I think that I have found the most ignoble way to die in the Warhammer 40k universe, they come up with something new and exciting that I hadn't thought of, like the human crew starving to death in the center of the earth. That's pretty ignoble. Getting devoured after by something that doesn't even need food. And um, not only that, after they pried you out of your dreadnoughts like a little oyster. That's very accurate, actually. I mean, he had no arms and legs anymore. I really do enjoy bivalves, too, and that's you know, might have ruined that for you forever. <laughs> I might have actually. Okay, so mind blown recently, I saw somebody because obviously we don't get fresh scallops here. I had never seen a fresh scallop in my life. They have so many organs and stuff that you have to. Anyways, that's kind of what I imagine now that you're saying that. I'm picturing it. Google what a fresh scallop looks like when they're pulling it out of its shell. Um, that's kind of now what I picture him looking like. Ew. I kind of did too, but like with the head. So anyway, anyway, thanks for that. Um, but that scene was horrifying. Like that whole, it was so tense and it was so scary. And at first I was like, I'm not going to hurt the swords of, Ke- oh my God, that guy's dead. <laughs> but he killed the dreadnought. Like it was, it was real. And by the end of the book, I mean, he killed so many of these named characters that by the end I was like, we know Uriel and Basanius are making it out. But like they, well, Uriel at least has the plot armor. Right. But I mean, by the end there, I was like, no one is safe. But that scene was so tense. And it, again, it was not only an ignoble death, it was something terrifying about something that's 
not even angry at you personally. It's just mindless. Mm -hmm. Doesn't even need to eat to survive, and it's eating you. It's almost like making this more graphic than it needs to be, but it made me think of the, the way it was like taking him in, when they're describing it, like a wood chipper. Yeah, kind of. I, for all of my fellow theater nerds out there, it reminded me of Suddenly Last Summer. And yes, I'm about to compare a Warhammer 40k novel to a Tennessee Williams play. But it, you know what? It fits. <laughs> Tennessee Williams, the grandfather of misery porn, hmm. um, which I'm a huge Tennessee Williams fan. Of, but when they talk about at the end with the, with the boy with the kids screaming pan pan pan. That's all I could think of was these Necrons just mad and crazed and pull. <laughs> when you start drawing parallels to suddenly last summer, you've done something effectively creepy. Um, this one, that scene though, I was like the whole time I was like, <gasps> okay. So well done. Again, bold report done right. But what does this kind of say about the Necrons in general? Like, so, actually, let me ask you this question about the Nightbringer. So, the Nightbringer shard kind of has a moment of, I know you. Mm -hmm. Do you think it works both ways? Do you think the Nightbringer shard that's out there is like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Right? Like, all of a sudden it realizes that a, one of its shards has died and it's like, oh, that asshole. I mean, I don't know enough about the Catan. Why not? At this point, I don't either honestly, I don't really, I don't, I don't really understand. Like, I don't know how the shards work because I know that. I mean, I I know conceptually how the shards work, but can, can they tell? Like, do you think they're getting that two way message, or was it more of like a recording, like a photo, right? Where it's like part of me knows, but actually, I guess it would have to, right? Because then, how the hell would it know? Not like that happened so in the past. So what that kind of makes me think of is if anyone has read any of the Halo novels and specifically looking at the Halo novels that uh, Karen Travis wrote, because in it, it involves the one of the big AIs, uh, BB Black Box. And he talks about how he is able to separate a shard from himself to kind of implant to somebody like a little AI, mm -hmm. but then he can take it back in and immediately get all those experiences and memories. So that's Right. Kind of what I was thinking, thinking what it was like in a way. Mm -hmm. Like maybe it's not a two way message, but it could rejoin. And then the main Nightbringer would be able to get all those experiences from the shard. And does that then become like, this is going to become like a rivalry, like a thing. Right. Where he's just going to be like, oh, that little guy. I don't know. I, mean, I don't know if that's. I would love that. If I don't know if that's something because you know because they have brought the Necrons into this big thing with Indominus and the Graham was just like, oh wait a second, <laughs> you remember that time when I released a Catan? <laughs> this seems like that one time could be useful. <laughs> that one time, uh, yeah, on Pavonis. <laughs> exactly. I um, still love that book. Yes, and so part of me. Like, I mean, a big part of me, I, I was just, I was so happy that they mentioned it in general. But now I'm like, ooh, this could be like a rivalry. Like, now it's going to be something that they have to encounter. Because eventually we're going to have to pay the price. Like, eventually the Piper is going to come, right? For Belisarius Call, who has released a shard. The Deceiver shard got released in Infinite and the Divine. Um, the Deceiver. <laughs> Um, like one of his shards gets released, this guy gets released. Like, this is eventually going to be a thing, and I do love the idea. Now, the is, that, whole... is that what's going to get the emperor off the throne? God damn it! I take a nap for ten thousand years, and you guys release all these shards. Maybe if they all coalesce at Mars to release their boy. Oh, the void dragon. I'm just saying oh, you know that's never going to happen because then it'll be like the end of days for Warhammer 40k and then they'll reboot be like comic books don't you put that evil on me I'm at the own crisis infinite earths anyways <laughs> <laughs> she's, 
She's not okay. She snorted so, at me. Like, uh, I can't. I can't even. Literally, can't even. Um, let's talk about the ending because there's so much going on in the ending. First off, the scene where she presents him with the new banner, and he's like, "Nah, not to me. You don't give this to me. You give this to somebody else." But when they unfurl it and they made it very clear where the Joyan mm. is. That was so cool. So awesome. Again, Graham McNeil knows how to do fan service, right? So we now have, as you said, he kind of has his own Mournval, right? Um, they, <laughs> they saved this planet. Saved being a very strong word for this. Um, well, they're not going to clean I'm, up. They're not going to clean up their mess. I mean, well, no. <laughs> We saved the planet. What else did you want? <laughs> That's for um, other people. <laughs> exactly. This is why we have the administratum. I, I do. I liked it a lot because it did remind me. It drove home the point in um, Andy Clark's Imperial Fist novel, where he's like, "You guys, we're the last line of defense. We're not here to like evacuate anyone or do mm-hmm. anything like that. Uh, we're nine one one." I did like that this kind of drove that point home too. Um, but so where do they go from here? Where do the sorts of Kelth go from here? They now are a group of really close, really tight badasses who, you know, they've got a shiny new banner and they have their Primaris captain and he's got a shiny new gun. Talk about how awesome that gun was for a minute. That might have been when I what forgave a- Lee Arches. <laughs> like he gave him a present okay fine he didn't just give him a present i know but you you know it kind of made me think of uh gosh a long time ago for any tennis fans out there there was this really funny john McEnroe commercial where he it's a credit card commercial and he he learns about a dispute resolution he was like also alternative dispute resolution he's like wow there's other ways there's like alter- alternatives to dispute resolution. I gotta go fix this. And he like drives to this guy's house and the, it's like a line judge. It's a door and he sees it's like, oh, it's McEnroe. He's like, you know, I was just thinking that, you know, maybe the ball actually was on the line and you're not evil. I had that moment with the arches. I'm like, okay, maybe you're not evil. <laughs> I did like when the scout when he's like Lyricus is gonna like kill you guys okay. like when he really is that that I laughed really hard was hilarious when they're like we're gonna go with you he's like no I'm not gonna let Lyricus call all of you <laughs> for codex violations it's like thank you Graham McNeil just thank you for that it was like and Lyricus to okay so I can forgive Lyricus I cannot forgive what's his name. Is it Lysander? Oh, Leandros? Leandros. Oh, from we'll Space Marine? <laughs> Lyricus gets to have a redemption arc. He doesn't. Uh, See, but now you bringing up Leandros just makes me remember that we're never going to get a sequel to have Titus's redemption. Graham McNeil, you work for Riot Games. Haven't they always wanted to make a non MOBA haven't they always wanted to make a shooter that takes place in the Warhammer 40k universe starring the Walmart great value version of Uriel Ventress because they couldn't get the rights to the Ultramarines omnibus that you wrote but guess what okay. Riot Games has you okay. they've got you that is so mean about Captain Titus <laughs> You're right. He's not the Walmart version, but he is kind of is the Pepsi OK version. (laughs) You're so mean. Anyways, the point is, Mr. McNeil, I feel as though now is the time for you to pitch this. And they have a writer on staff, you. So first of all, uh, Riot will never let go of MOBAs. They make way too much money. Um... I don't, okay, look, like, eventually, like, how many gold-plated toilets do they need in their office building? All like, of them. Is, like, is the fact that the whole parking lot is filled with, like, Ferraris and Lamborghinis, like, eventually at some point, can't you have a pet passion project? 
of making a sequel to Warhammer 40k I think Space their Marine. Pet passion project was actually creating a mobile version of League of Legends called Wild Rift. <laughs> that's their pet passion project right now. Right, but that's a lame pet project. It this may be. be awesome. But... <laughs> this would be so awesome. You would be the hero of like the whole internet and fandom. Just saying. They would. But they're probably also under the impression of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> probably true. But I'm just saying. I think there's a real thing here. Anyways. I would rather somebody um, else than Riot Games do it. But that's just me. But they have Graham McNeil. They do. But THQ Nordic actually has THQ who could resurrect this if they so choose. Please do. With this Pepsi OK Uriel, I'm totally good with it. Just be sure to bring back the uh, voice actor, please. Uh, Mark Strong. Yes, thank you. I knew it was strong, but yes. (laughs) Wild crush on Mark Strong. Anyways. I just have a crush on his Um, voice. It's so dreamy. (laughs) Anyways. Um, I... That whole scene, like, he, he's got a brand new gun, he's got his guys, his guys are super excited, and, like, where do they go now? Do they just go back and rejoin Gulliman? Or are they always, like, do they go back and rejoin Gulliman, but under the, like, they're just waiting for the siren song of the Necrons? I think they do whatever Gulliman tells them to do. Do they all stick together, though? I want to kind of envision them like the Guardians of the Galaxy, like the end of the first movie. And it's like, so where to? (laughs) You know? Right. I kind of envision them like that. But I also know that, you know, since Gulliman and Uriel are back besties now that, you know, they're just going to wait. They're going to, you know, send their report to Gulliman. He'll get to it in nine months and be like, okay, I have a new assignment for you. I would really like if he gets to their report right after he gets to Belisarius's calls and he's like you you released a what now and then he gets to Uriel's report and he's like oh another one like the shards be moving it's a so you're saying this might be another voicemail for Robbie Bobby I feel like this would at least this this isn't a voicemail you deliver this one in person (laughs) The singing telegram. Um, I think the uh, call, Bryl's Liar's call leaves a message. Oh, for sure. For sure. Belisarius' call 100% leaves a message. On his and, rogue AI. And it's uh, it's a meandering. Oh, no, not the rogue AI. That one, he'll actually call the voicemail, but it'll be like a meandering message um, about, like, gene stealers and necrons. But... I really like the idea that now they're like this, I mean, there's there's just this, they're this awesome group of guys who are super close. And as you said, it's like kind of his own personal Morval. They're kind of like the Fab Five from Sons of Selenar slash uh, Angel Exterminatus, or like, they're going to go off and kick some ass in the name of Gulliman. I'm so excited. Like, I got to the end of this book and I was like, but I want more. I I kind of was the same. I was really happy that, um, that Kyprian, Kyprian, survived i was really worried about him like after Mm -hmm. his after hadrian died i was like i'm not going to it's not going to be cool if if he dies too and i was really happy about you know telian uh i mean old man guess we guess we just can't kill this guy which is which is fine because he's amazing i loved him i loved uh... that he used uriel as bait and uriel's response when he realized it was good shot (laughs) I loved that. Um, I also cannot get enough from Tech Marine Harkus, by the way. Like I love Harkus. I don't direct like direct you know and, to my veins. And you know how much like I'm not care I don't really care about the Mechanicus and, and all that, but you know, to the Tech Marines is like, I'll allow it. Harkus is just awesome. Awesome. Um, by the way, one of my favorite scenes for an ending note in this book is of course when <laughs> Uh, Elia Vivaro comes through and she's like, I knew you'd still be alive. Right? Yeah, the- so exci- like, okay. Is it, a, is it a little Deus Ex Machina-ish? It is, but it's done right. It is, but at the same time, I think it would be more Deus Ex Machina if they figured out how to teleport out. 
I actually even said that when I was reading it. I was like, okay, like, I don't love that they were able to teleport to the center of the earth, but as long as they can't get back that the way that they came, that's fine. And sure enough, I was a little bit worried about that, but I do like when Lyric just is like, what is that noise? And Uriel's like, yeah, I have an idea. <laughs> you do, of course you do. It was just such a nice note to bring them back, and it was such a nice way to just update them and make them, but like bring them back out of that older chapter and into the forefront and very much active players in Gulliman's game. We know that Cato Sicarius is already active, right? Um, well, Cato we Sicarius know- is like traveling with Gulliman. I mean, right. He, he's his, Sicarius. He's his understudy. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, we know that Marnius Calgar is alive, is moving around and doing stuff. So I like the idea that now, like, the idea should have been that these captains were very trusted people who you could, like, move and have do things. And I really do, I like that. And I like seeing this favorite character coming back to the forefront, but not feeling too horned in. Right. Not that I'm suggesting that we recently read a book that felt a little quasi shoehorned. Um, this one, this one though, for sure, I thought was done so naturally. Now, normally we don't talk about this kind of stuff, but I really want to with this book because I think it bears, uh, it bears conversation. Let's talk about Graham McNeil's intro and afterward. What did you, well, first of all, I'm curious if that's even in anybody else's books. I don't know if they're going to, I don't know if it's going to come with the hardback version. I don't know if it's just limited edition. Because it's very important. So in the intro, Graham McNeil talks about how it's been a very long time. Uh, It's been a spell. And he's been a little bit busy. Um, But I do like the idea where he said that, let's see, I had big plans for the next books, an epic trilogy involving a huge Necron invasion of Ultramar, a Necrosphere constructed around a crag and a potential storyline where Reboot Gulliman returned to the fold, albeit in the toys back in the box at the end kind of way. So the fact that, because I looked this up and I can't remember now off the top of my head, but I think that sixth book comes out like in 2013, 14. It's been a while. The idea that he was already kind of looking at like, how could we get Reboot out of Hawk? And that he wanted to bring in the Necrons. Very forward thinking. Like I definitely had his finger on the pulse of where... Mm-hmm. games workshop how they think and how they move right which well, I think is really awesome also like Gulliman is really the only Primarch that's kind of easy to have come back I mean yes he's in very much he's so. in stasis and kind of comatose but it's not like it's mm-hmm. impossible in the last 10,000 years to figure out how to keep him from dying from Fulgrim's knife wound right very much so so he was definitely easier, but also just with the ultramarines, right? It's kind of a natural fit. Um, so I really liked the idea that he kind of was already thinking about that. And the idea that he goes away for a few years, he comes back. Oh, yeah, Reboot's alive and well, by the way. Uh, and this is all moving. So his afterward, he talks about how he's like, this was hard. Because the whole Rubicon Primaris and wanting to update some of these named characters and... How do you bring, because remember that first Uriel Ventress book is written in the early aughts. Mm -hmm. So how do you bring something that much, like, how do you drag that into the present? And I don't envy him that task. And it's so well written, by the way, the afterword and the intro, like, they're just really nice. Um, But he does say specifically, let's go to my afterword here, um, that, let's see. I look forward to exploring more of them with Uriel Ventress and his newly reformed Swords of Cal. I hope you'll come with me when I do. Always. Oh, I'm I'm there. Like, you don't need to ask. Really there. But I think... I do like that he references some of the book... Whoa. <laughs> Space bars, how do they work? Um... <laughs> I do like that he references some of the other books that he's been keeping up with the lore and like he really did do his research into how to bring this in um, responsibly, I guess. So again, it doesn't feel shoehorned and he does feel like he's very current, which he's very good at. I think it's like 
the intro and the outro, usually I'm just like, mm, that's interesting. This one, I don't know why, for some reason it hit me in the feels. And I like, I liked that he was concerned whether or not he was going to make it feel natural. It, this book felt to me, quite honestly, like this was a love letter from him to his Uriel Ventress fans. And so. by bringing Nightbringer into this, you know, it just kind of all brings it back around full circle. You know, mm-hmm. I know what you think of the sequels to Star Wars and all that, but hold on a second. You can really say that the seventh movie was kind of a rehashing of A New Hope. There was a lot of similarities in how things went. You had, you know, the a random person, like you had the Tatooine, you had... Um, well, episode five. No, no, no. Oh, so, no, New Hope. Episode four, the very first... Seven, star- seven, seven, seven. Sorry, sorry. Sorry, seven. Yes. So if you look at like A New Hope and uh, The Force Awakens, they right, right. follow oh, yeah. very linearly with each other and actually you can say the same Mm -hmm. thing about a new hope and um phantom menace and actually that was something that i even commented when i first saw the phantom menace in the theater i was like oh let me guess they're gonna you know get the shields down and then blow it up in the center okay i've seen this before and george lucas did that on purpose and then jj abrams again did that on purpose to kind of have that circling back to bring it back to remember what you guys liked with the new hope just to kind of circle it back to that and i feel like that's exactly what graham mcneil did with this without george lucas seeing it up very much so and one of the things i thought was really interesting is that when he talks about how like he and phil kelly wrote the codex for necrons forever ago (laughs) right so like it's it's in i don't know how to say this without casting shade at another book that we recently read. But we did talk about how Dan Abnett's been around for a really long time, obviously. And it felt like he had, with Penitent, I think one of our biggest complaints was that it felt like he had to come in and throw his weight around and be like, "Uh, excuse you, I helped build this house. I loved how much more natural this was that he felt like he really wanted to, kind of like you said, like get that parody in there, but make it feel very natural and remind you what you loved about this while also making it very clear that he has definitely kept up with the progression and that this wasn't, he didn't have necessarily have anything to prove other than just to remind you how much you love these characters. Even more than that, it's not about what he has to prove, but how much he loves this character. Um, You know, and the world, the universe. When I got to meet him, gosh, it seems like it was like 10 years ago, even though it was just in 2019. Uh-huh. You're right. Uh, he, you know, kind of mentioned like how much he loves how Guy Haley has taken this world and just made it his own in a way without overly inserting himself into it. Does it I'm, not sure, I'm not sure if it explains for, as well as he put it. But there was that, like, he was just, like, so happy to see, like, how much mm-hmm. the world has progressed. And right. I, I feel like we could really see that in this book. Whereas I feel like we didn't, we don't feel that way about Dan Abnett and what he has done. Yes. I would agree. And I, and I don't, I don't want to make it sound like I'm pitting the two authors against each other. And I'm like, well, Grabbing is clearly better than Dan Abnett. No, I'm not I saying guess- that. I'm just, like, all right, I'm saying... No. All I'm saying is, is that, um, what am I saying? Because now you said that, now I can't get that out of my head. It's just, um, just different ways. We liked the approach better. It's just different methods of using what's going on. And I think, honestly, it's easier for Dan Abnett to kind of throw his weight around because that all takes place in the past before the, the rift, before the rift opens. So Very much so. It's a little, I would agree with that. It's a little easier for him to kind of, yeah, he's throwing his weight around, but he's staying in the world he already created years ago that was already in the past. Very much so. And this feels like such a nice, thriving part of the new world. I guess I, I can't, I don't really know what else to say other than how much I really enjoyed it and how nice it was to see, because you do kind of worry 
right? Like it's been forever since we've first seen these characters. Are they going to feel like they don't belong? Because the last nope. thing that you want, because we've all done this, we've all read a book series that went on way too lo- much, way too long, for longer than it should have. Like it should have been a trilogy instead of six books. And uh, that's so easy to Song s- of Ice and Fire is seen. That's not even over yet. And anyway, were you throwing shade at the Wheel of Time? Heaven forbid. I was not throwing shade at Wheel of Time because I don't. Look, Carrie, we needed five books that just summarize the events of the other five books that came before it. Okay. care about the wheel of time i find the books boring you can at me i don't care but we've all had those where it's like oh my god this should have ended like you ended it just fine after three why are we continuing a story and it's like right. when you but you know like okay so song of ice and fire it's not that they should have ended it it's just that he just can't stop writing same right. thing and the same thing with, with, with wheel of time but you know like there's uh, there's one series in mind but you guys probably don't know what it is but the, it should have ended at the third book but the problem is, is that the trilogy was so popular the author i'm pretty sure was pressured to keep going right and then trilogy that followed after that was just not good and not even needed and you kind of worry about that because you know the way that graham mcneil ended those six books it's nice it's perfectly nice. That's very nice. Wrapped it up, everything with Hanso. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you kind of worry, like, okay, is this going to be a sign of quit while you're ahead, old man? And it wasn't. It was not. Um, so here's something that's kind of interesting about, like, the books that we've been reading recently. So we read Penitent, which was the sequel, like, almost 12 years later, almost 10 years later. Um, to Pariah, which was kind of definitely an author where we were like, "Mm, I'm so sure about this one. Characters that we knew, not necessarily loved. Then we read this guy that was waiting for, for, that, you know, we've been waiting for a really long time for. Author we know and love. Characters we know and love. And then we're transitioning (laughs) into very cold waters. Uh Hey! um, To check out Silent Hunters by Eduardo Albert. I have not yet read anything by him, which is pretty exciting to me. And I don't think I have read a single book about the Carcharodons. I've never even heard of the Carcharodons. Um, I've always really liked the idea of them because I love my Raven Guard and I love any alleged, assumed um, successor chapter of the Raven Guard. So I'm actually really excited about this. Additionally, it takes place in Kimura, which I'm just curious about shark people. Um, ha- I have a lot of questions about the shark people as well. Like, don't get me wrong, sharks are amazing and they're awesome. And you know, Jaws. Um, I you think also, not also, subtle. That's no, actually, silent. you know what this is about as subtle as Warhammer Forty K gets because it's as subtle as a two by four across the face. I was gonna say, hmm. um, Ferris Manus says what's up. <laughs> um, the actually he doesn't. He doesn't say dead. anything. Actually, yeah, he ain't saying much right now. He did. Um, he he did. This one, I, I'm really excited to see because the last book that we read dealing with Kimura and the um actually really the last author we saw dealing with the Jukari and Kimura was Josh Reynolds, and so I'm I'm interested to see what somebody else does with it. But it's it's just funny that we were like old classic, old classic brand new um but you know what i have pretty high hopes and i feel i hope i hope i'm not setting myself up for disappointment because robert rath and infinite and the divine like uh the okay i had the bar pretty low set for for that book brand new author brand new author to warhammer 40k i don't like the necrons Jen dragged me to that book, kicking and screaming, just like she did *Lords of Silence*. And then it ended up, and it ended up being like one of my favorite books. I keep hoping that one day I'm going to drag her kicking and screaming, like to some Blood Angels thing that she's going to love. But I have a feeling that's just never going to happen. Sorry. Although I, I did drag you kicking and screaming to one one book, *War of Secrets*. You didn't want to read it. You knew we had to true dark angels and we both ended up loving it 
actually Luther as well. Mm. I was not super like I it was a beautiful book and I got it, but I was kind of like, mm, I don't care about Luther at all. Um, love a dude. I like, I don't like the Dark Angels. But yeah, so I'm excited to read Silent Hunters. I think this is going to be a fun change of pace for us. Something totally different. I <laughs> now for something completely different. Also, <laughs> chaplains and their skull faces. They look so angry. That's why I thought this is actually a descendant of the Black Templars. Like they all, really chaplains all look like they wanted to be part of the Black Templars, but they were told they couldn't be. And so now they're just real it's, angry. It's just the skull face. This is not very spiritually inspiring. <laughs> Apparently it is of the Warhammer 40k universe. Though. Well, that fits for the Warhammer 40k universe that skulls would be spiritually then again, the Emperor's face is kind of a skull right now, so with a fake eye. So, I mean, yeah. I mean, if I've learned nothing from text to speech, that's definitely what I've learned. Do you want to take us out, Carrie? <laughs> I sure will. So thank you so much. You've listened to the Warhammer 40k book club episode regarding Swords of Calf by Graham McNeil. Be sure to join us for our next book, Silent Hunters by Eduardo Albert. We are an unofficial book club and not affiliated with the Black Library or any of its affiliates. You can find both the vidcast and podcast on our website, wh40kbookclub.com. If you like this episode, please like, subscribe, give a review, and all those good things to the vidcast on YouTube or the podcast anywhere you get podcasts. Don't forget, we also have a Patreon where we offer two different tiers of content for your viewing and listening pleasure. You can learn more about that at patreon.com slash wh40k book club. Yes, I said that right. <laughs> Our site has also has articles about adventures and reading other Warhammer 40k books and short stories out cut outside of the book club books. So please stay a while and read from a crap. I'm still all furious. Just saying. Do some different shade of chartreuse. Actually, it's not chartreuse. It's just green. It definitely gets you this green. It's kind of like what a teal green, right? Whatever. It is a little tealer. It's not it's much tealer than that, but like this is. This is a more rewarding Necron green. It's not, it's no chartreuse, I'll give you that. It doesn't shine like a beacon from the top of a bookcase. Never mind. Get you some chartreuse. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>